happened at the end of those, that 40 days. Acts 1.9 tells us, says this, When he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Sounds very similar to the question that was asked of the ladies at the tomb, right? What are you doing here? And the angels say this, This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So we know he's coming back just like he left. So he ascended. Now, I don't know when, when you're reading scripture what goes through your mind, but I, I absolutely wonder what was going through the disciples' mind in that moment. Their, their, their Messiah... They thought he was going to overthrow Rome. He gets crucified, and they have the weekend going, what just happened? Well, then he comes back to life. They have 40 days. They're excited. Okay, he is going to inaugurate the kingdom, and then he goes up into the clouds. I'm very sure. Now, this is me hypothesizing, but I'm very sure a few of them, at least, if not all of them, are looking around going, well, what do we do now? What's next? Well, it also may cause us to ask the question, well, what is Jesus doing? He ascended into heaven. What, what is he doing now? What is, what's going on? And he's actually doing quite a bit. So you have, if you have your handouts, uh, the back of the prayer guide, you'll see some blanks there. Let's see if this works. There we go. Yeah. So one of the things he's doing is he's preparing believers' eternal dwelling places. I was just reminded of this um, as I, um, I helped with a funeral over the weekend, uh, last weekend. John 14, 1 says this. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He's preparing dwelling places for believers. He's also building his church, Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not overpower it or overcome it. He's also nourishing his church, Ephesians 5, 29. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. I love these verses. There's a lot of things that we invest in. There's things that we think are important, and we spend time, we put time and energy and money into them. But we can know that if we're investing in our church, we're doing the work that Jesus is doing. Because he's building his church. He's nourishing his church. Not only that, he's the head over his church, right? Ephesians 1, 22, He put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I love this. I just I had an opportunity this afternoon. So neat. Years, years, years ago, uh, we were early missionaries in Niger. One of the teenagers that was there, I, I have not spoken with him since 2007. Graduated from high school, went to college in Ghana. God has worked in his life. He ended up at a Bible college in Cincinnati. He just took a senior pastor role outside of Minnesota, a young man from Ghana. It's a great conversation this afternoon. He's like, I wanted to reach out to you. I'm a lead pastor. I wanted to reach out to another lead pastor. How cool is that to get to talk to a student from my youth group? And he's praising God for what he's doing. And it was neat to talk to another young man who's saying, I'm so glad I'm an under shepherd. Jesus is the head of the church, and we get to follow him. It's his church, and he knows what he's doing, and we're following him. Oh, what a neat thing. It was so cool. Wow, there I am. There you are. So he's the head of the church. He's also the cornerstone of the building, Ephesians 2.20. Having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And that's really the key, actually, of what we're doing tonight. We're going to be talking about a specific role of Jesus. He is the foundation of the church. He's the foundation of everything that we're doing. All right? He's also sustaining the universe. This is, I love this verse, Colossians 1.17. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. We get total eclipses because Jesus is holding all things together. The stars aren't spinning off into space because he's holding all things together. I love that. He's also the high priest over a royal priesthood. 
Hebrews 4.14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. He's also advocating for believers. 1 John 2.1, my little children, I'm writing these things to you that you, may be, that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. I love that verse. Just talking with someone this afternoon. If you've asked Jesus to forgive your sins, he promises to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, and he's our advocate. There's no condemnation in Christ. So if, if we sin, when we sin, we confess it again, knowing that Jesus, it's like he's our lawyer with God. And he's got an in with God, right? Wow, he's our advocate. And then lastly, amazing, he is mediating between God and man. First Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Okay, and this is our topic for tonight, mediating, mediator. What does this mean? What is a mediator? Well, there's two definitions I wanted to give you. These are blanks you can fill in. One is this, one who goes between two parties in an attempt to reconcile them. So this is the general definition of a mediator. And maybe you've had this in, in, uh, in your life. Uh, there's been a, a conflict with someone, and you've asked a third party, could you help us with this? One who goes between two parties in an attempt to reconcile them. So hang on to that, and let me give you the next definition. This one's more specific. The role that Jesus plays in coming between God and us, enabling us to come into the presence of God. The role that Jesus plays in coming between God and us, enabling us to come into the presence of God. So that, that should probably prompt a question in our minds. Well, why? Why does Jesus need to go between God and us? What's, what's the issue? Why can't we just go straight to God, right? And it's a worthwhile question. So is this even needed? The answer is yes. God and mankind have become estranged. We're actually at odds with God. We're at enmity with him. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, verse 18, if you will. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. We're going to flip through a few verses in, in the book of Romans. Or if you're on a device, you'll scroll through. But uh, Romans 1, 18. It is interesting in a... As you're thinking about communicating clearly, there's, there's stuff that I, you know, you get taught. Don't say turn in your Bibles to such and such, because someone who's never held a paper Bible, they're like, I don't need to turn this over. I just, so scroll in your Bibles to find in your Bibles. You, you figure it out. Romans 1.18 says this, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I'm in the book of Judges for part of my morning Bible reading. I can't stand the book of Judges. And I'm, figure, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to preach this someday. There are stories in the book of Judges that just make me mad. The sin is unbelievable. Uh, the story I was reading this morning, the lady is like, Oh, thank you, Yahweh, that my son admitted that he stole the silver from me, so we're going to make an idol out of it. She's praying to Yahweh, to the Lord, thanking him for giving the silver back so she can make an idol. It's just terrible. Completely misguided because everyone's doing what was right in their own eyes. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's what's going on in the time of the judges. They're suppressing the truth. Turn or scroll to Romans 3, 23. Romans 3, 23. Says this, Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Then scroll a little bit farther to Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 7. Romans 8, 7. And we know there's lots in between these verses. I've just obviously picked out a couple here. Romans 8, 7 says this, because the carnal mind or the, the fleshly mind or the natural mind 
Uh, Paul is talking about those who, who have not been forgiven of their sins. He says, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So, and we know Isaiah 53, 6, probably all of us in this room have that verse memorized, right? It, where we say, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way or his own way, right? We, we've all wandered out of the sheep pen. All of us have. That's who we are. Ephesians 2. Will you turn there, please? Ephesians 2, or find that one. I'd like you to see these words of Scripture with your own eyes. I'm not making them up, I promise. Ephesians 2, 12. Paul says this, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the hope, excuse me, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So what he's saying in verse 12 there is, when we, when anyone is without Christ, that is equal to having no hope because we are without God. That, that is a frightening concept. One more verse, uh, go forward to Ephesians 4, verse 18, please. Ephesians 4, 18. And he, he describes our condition apart from Christ in this way. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. So is, is there a need for someone to go between us and God, between mankind and God? The answer is absolutely yes. And, and James used this exact wording in um, in describing why we are so passionate about missions, because we are in darkness. Verse, verse 18, having their understanding darkened, the blindness of their heart. That's who we are unless Christ intervenes in our lives. We're under God's wrath apart from what Christ has done, right? So there is a huge problem. Now, the danger is in our blindness... Before salvation, we don't, we don't even know, right? We, are, we see symptoms, okay? For example, we know, and this is epidemic, it's all over the world, we know we're struggling with loneliness as people, right? We see that loneliness. What we don't realize, though, as people is that's actually an issue of a broken relationship with God. We think it's an issue of, oh, I need more friends around me. I need, to, I need community. I need other people, Right? But at the, the heart of it, actually, we, we have a broken relationship with God because in God, there's family. In God, there's acceptance. In God, there's relationship. In God, there, there's true acceptance. There's unconditional love. There's committed love. That's what a relationship with God looks like. Not only that, so we also, so loneliness is a symptom the issue is a broken relationship with God. Anger is something that our world recognizes. Yeah, we have, a, we have an issue here that this is, this is a problem. But see, anger actually is a, it's a sign of a broken relationship with God. How do I know that? Because in God, we know the Hebrew word shalom, right? It's, it, there's a wholeness. In God, there's peace. In God, there's justice. When we know God and we have a right relationship with God, we know he is going to work things out. And so we can be at peace with how things are going. We don't need to be angry. So anger is a symptom that there's a broken relationship with God. And jealousy, greed, we could keep going. Jealousy and greed, that's a broken relationship with God because in God, he provides. Amy just testified. There's provision. There's contentment. There's satisfaction in God, right? So, apart from Christ, unless God intervenes, we, we, we are at odds with God, and, and there's, a, there's a huge issue here. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because what Jesus does in this role of being a mediator is absolutely amazing. And I want to draw our hearts, lift our hearts this evening to just being full of thankfulness for what Jesus has done in this specific role of being a mediator between us and God. Okay, so, so, but I want to ask one more question before we dive in, and that's this. 
if Jesus is the answer, and he is, why is 75% of the Bible the Old Testament? I don't know if you've ever asked that question. But I think it's a good question. I think it's a real question. The, the vast majority of our scriptures are the Old Testament before Christ. So if Jesus is the answer, and he is, why is so much of it the Old Testament? Does that make sense? Well, I think because, I think there's multiple reasons, but when we spend time in the Old Testament, what happens is this, and you have a few more blanks now. You can get your pens going. In in the Old Testament, we see clearly what sin is. And some of what upsets me so much about the book of Judges, that then specifically points to how patient and how loving God is. When we see sin for what it is, and it is awful, and it is horrific, it shows us the great lengths God has gone to be patient with us and to provide for us. And so when I look at the book of Judges and I get disgusted and frustrated, I then realize I'm looking in a mirror. And Jesus has saved me. I'm not any, I'm not any better than any of those guys. And so I'm reminded, this is who Jesus is as my mediator. It's, it's, it's absolutely stunning. The great lengths that God has gone, gone to to save us. So in early in the Old Testament, uh, Job, uh, we know is, he's more in the middle if you're, if you're reading it through, but we know that Job is early. He's probably about the same time as Abraham, right? And Job says, right, the, he's got his friends telling him all things he did wrong. And what does Job say? Job says, if only I had a mediator, right? So it's one of his, his pleas. If I had a mediator to help here, someone that could, could come between us, right? We long for peace. We long for peace in relationships with others. We long for peace in our homes. We long for peace with God. All of us do. And what I'm here to tell you tonight is Jesus does work that peace. We need to keep, keep our eyes on him. Okay, so how does this work? Well, 75% of the Bible is the Old Testament. And part of what is happening in the Old Testament is God is bringing mediators to the nation of Israel to show them what Christ is going to be like. There's three classes of mediators that we see over and over in the Old Testament. The first is this. Prophets. Moses is one of them. Elijah, Isaiah, there's lots of them, right? They're prophets. And what they did was they were to bring God's word to the people. And we see it with Moses. He's going up and down the mountain. He's got the Ten Commandments. He's got, and he's, he's getting God's message to the people. That's what a prophet does. Hebrews 1.1 says this, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. That's how God revealed himself. The problem is the messages were fragmentary, right? They were pieces. And they're, they're, I like the word they were enigmatic. They were, we could say, murky. They were opaque. There's times I'm in the New Testament and I see, a pro, I see Christ and there's a little letter next to the verse. So I go back and I look at the prophecy that it, will, that it will happen in the Old Testament. And when I read the prophecy in the Old Testament, I can see, oh yeah, that's, that's how that works. But if I just read the Old Testament on its own, I don't think I'm smart enough to see. And there was lots of people, lots of Jews that missed it too. Do you, you see what I'm saying? So there were prophecies pointing to Christ, but on, before the cross, most of them missed it. So God was revealing himself, but it, people didn't see. Now, when Jesus came, we can see God, right? So there's prophets. The second class is the priests. And, uh, and Aaron is one of those. And this is different. This is now the mediator is going from the people up to God. So Aaron is one of the priests who offers sacrifices so that sin could be forgiven. And again, it, we know that that was good and that was helpful, but it was temporary. It was preparing for a better sacrifice because those sacrifices were at best one year. They had to go in every year, but people would, could come to the temple in the middle of the year and offer sacrifices for sin as well, right? It was temporary. Hebrews 10, 4 says, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. They couldn't sustain the peace. And then the third class was the kings. You got David and Saul and Solomon, all of those. And this is, again, God to man. This is, this is God's rule over people. But the kings were plagued by their own sinfulness. They were plagued by sinfulness. 
And they even, in many cases, the kings themselves led the people into, into worshiping other gods. And it's the Gospel of Matthew especially that shows Jesus is the rightful king. He's the heir to the throne, right? So we have these mediators in the Old Testament and, and lots of stories around them, but they were to point the people of Israel, there's a better way. There is a better way. And, and in, the, in the book of Hebrews, that's, that's one of the main points in the book of Hebrews is Jesus is the better way. He fulfills these. He is the mediator. So let's ask some questions. Let's, let's, let's think about this being a better way. If you will, turn to, to 1 Timothy. I, I quoted this verse earlier, but I'd like for you to see it yourself because it is very clear. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. Let me start at verse 1, 1 Timothy 2, 1. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks may be, be made for all men. It's what we are doing this evening. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to, knowledge, to the knowledge of the truth. Then he says this, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now that is huge. What that means, that means a number of things, but one of the things that that means is you do not need to go to Pastor Dave for Pastor Dave to offer a sacrifice or for Pastor Dave to pray for you. You can go straight to your Heavenly Father, and we'll prove it in a few moments. There's one mediator, it's Jesus. Now that, that's powerful. John 14, 6 says this. Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I love it. I love it. So why did the ultimate, the better, the perfect mediator come? Well, this is powerful. He came to reveal God to people. Right? So we could see God in his laws. We can see the character of God in the Ten Commandments for sure. But... In Jesus, it's three-dimensional. We see God in flesh and blood. We see how he responds to people. We see his, his care, his concern, his tenderness. I love that when we went through the book of Mark. Jesus was so intentional. He was so patient. He was so kind with people. We also see his power. Some of those miracles. He's standing up in the boat, and the waves stop. The storm stops. None of us have seen power like that in person. He has all power. I love Jesus' wittiness. I love his humor. There's, I just, there's, there's moments where reading the scenes and you just long to be there, to see the, the person's reaction when Jesus catches them. And they're like, oh, yeah, you got me. And they walk away. I love it. Oh. Hebrews 1.3 says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. Colossians 1.15 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God. Think about that. The Son is the, Im the image of the invisible God. We cannot see God the Father, but we can see Jesus. And He gave us His word. I love that. Not only that, why did the better mediator come? He came to redeem his people from sin. And we spent our, our time last week on that. He came to pay the penalty, right? Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Give his life as a ransom for many. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is a mind-boggling truth mind-boggling truth. And that's the gospel. Jesus came to do the work that none of us could do. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. Jesus did it for us. That's, I, I love that. And he came to restore people to God, to restore people to God. Now, this is next week. We're going to talk about reconciliation. So let me just quote uh, two verses, and then uh, we'll, we'll keep going. First John 3 one and two says this, behold, you know these verses too, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Can you just pause? Thank God for that right now. 
You're his child. I've said those words several times to Bill this week. Donna was God's treasured, cherished daughter. A prized possession. And he loves her and he loves you, Bill. Each of us need to be reminded of that truth. You are a treasured possession. Wow. That we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And we can't wait. We cannot wait. There's a quote, but I am running out of time, so I'm going to keep going. That's a good quote. You can get it from me later if you'd like. How is the mediator's work done? All right, so I've already spilled the beans on this. You know how the mediator's work is done, but let me, let me give it to you anyway. He's a prophet. All right, he's the ultimate prophet, right? God spoke by him. He spoke words. We have them as red letters in our Bibles, but he's the living word, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He's the living word. Amen. And he continues to speak through his word today. As we carefully, properly study it, we hear from God as it is faithfully preached. If a preacher will faithfully preach God's word, God is speaking today through his son, through his living word. It's a powerful thing. Amen. That's why pastors need to get out of the way and just preach the word. Because Jesus is alive, and this word is alive, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating even to soul and spirit, right? Man. Hebrews 1, 2. In these last days, spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Amazing. And it was predicted, Deuteronomy 18, 15. He also is the ultimate priest, and we know this. Jesus made a once-for-all sacrifice. A once-for-all sacrifice. I was just listening to a message, and this is one of those arguments. I don't know if you're familiar. There's some that believe that in communion, the, the, the blood and the, the bread, they, they're, they actually become Jesus' body. If you believe that, you, you need to be very, very careful. If you believe that, those that believe that are believing that Jesus is being crucified over and over, and he's still bleeding, and that blood is the communion. And, and it's, it's some mystical experience. That's not what Hebrews teaches. Jesus died once for all. That one sacrifice was sufficient because he's perfect. He's not being crucified over and over and over again. So communion is, we remember, those are symbols that represent him, but he's not, that's not his actual blood in those cups. Hebrews 10.10. 10. By that will... We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ, of Jesus Christ, once for all. You can read Hebrews 8 through 10, 9 through 10. Uh, to, to, that argument is very clear. It's amazing. But, but not only this, Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore he, capital H, he, Jesus, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. So as a mediator, he's making intercession for us. For those that come to him and say, I need a savior, he goes straight to his father and says, all right, this one's yours, right? He's making intercession, Romans 8, 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. That's so important. So we know that we can pray in confidence because Jesus is sitting at the right hand of his Father, interceding on our behalf, going to his Father. It's unbelievable. It's going to get even better in just a second. And he's also king. And we know this. This one's crystal clear. Zechariah 6.13 says this, Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. He is on the throne. And in uh, Revelation 19, if you want to turn there, these verses are amazing. Revelation 19, verse 11. Revelation 19, 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Y'all know what's coming. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. 
what a scene. What a scene God is painting through John. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. At that moment, my mind explodes. I don't know how to imagine that. That he should strike the nation, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's the rightful king. So all these other kings that Israel ever had, they were pointing to, no, Jesus is going to sit on his throne and he is going to justly rule. It's amazing. So how do we respond to these truths? Two, two quick thoughts. First of all, as I was studying this concept of mediator, one of the things that the theologians that I was, I was reading implored me, implored their readers to do is they said, we need to understand. And this was very helpful to me. They said, read the Gospels in light of Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. All four of the Gospel writers are trying to help us see that all of the Old Testament examples were inadequate. They're heroes, we love them, but they were inadequate. They were pointing to Jesus. And as Jesus is working out that three-year ministry, he is proving, I am the ultimate prophet, I am the ultimate priest, and I am the ultimate king. It's very interesting. And so the, the theologians are saying, to understand how powerful this is, read the Gospels in light of Jesus in this role as mediator. He is the go-between between God and us. He's making it all right. It's very powerful. Then, lastly, is this. We can pray with confidence. We can pray with confidence. Why? Because Jesus tells us that we can come boldly to the throne. Let me read three verses as I close. And I, I don't know about your day, you know, my, you know parts of my schedule. You know that I start praying before my feet hit the floor. I prayed this morning in the car multiple times. I prayed by myself. I had meetings with folks. I prayed with folks in meetings. I, had the, I, just, it was just, I had met with someone in Hungary today. Got to pray with them in, in a meeting. We have such a privilege to go to our Father. But, but let me read three verses and, and, and think of the significance of this. Hebrews 4.16 says this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16, if you want to write that down. That's an incredible verse. You can go boldly to the throne, the almighty throne, because he's your heavenly father that loves you. But it gets even better. Matthew 7.11 says this. If you then, being evil, I'm kind of like, oh, that hurts. But yes, it's true. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? If you love giving good gifts to others, how much more infinitely loving is your heavenly Father? So go to him and ask. Romans 8.26, Likewise, the Spirit, it's not only that Jesus intercedes, but listen to this. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I prayed those prayers today too. I said, God, this is your church. And there's some stuff I'd really like to see happen. I don't know how to get there. But you do, and it's for your glory. We want to reach our neighbors. Will you help us? And I don't know how to articulate all those prayers, but the Holy Spirit can articulate for me, for us, so we can go boldly before the throne. Your Father loves you. So pray with confidence, right? Because we have an amazing mediator. Let me pray for us. Father, you truly are amazing. And I, I just want to pause and thank you for every one of us, for me. Thank you for allowing us to be on this side of the cross. I, I just thank you that you've, we have your word. We, we can know your son. You're so good to us. Thank you. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your son who intercede on our behalf. Thank you for a mediator who's gone between you and me. And because of him, you love me. And you love each of us. And you forgive our sins. And we say thank you. Thank you. And it's in your precious son's name we come to you. Amen.